Jonas is Bonnie Todd Mysterious, uh, mysterious characters. So mysterious, in fact, that after 300 years, no one really knows what that piece is about. Um, I have my own theory, but I'm not going to go into that. Um, the Brahms was truly a Renaissance man, and I think that some of his influences are perhaps better known than others. So, for example, um, it's well known that his, um, in his day, he was thought of as the heir to Beethoven's legacy. It's also well known that he was influenced by Hungarian music and, and his collaboration with uh, Josef Joachim. Um, it's known that he edited and admired the works of Chopin and uh, Weber. And so there's all these influences, but one influence that I think is perhaps underestimated is his encyclopedic knowledge of the Baroque. And not only J.S. Bach, but also Handel and Kupran. And he co-edited the 27 orders of Kupran's harpsichord music, which is hundreds and hundreds of pieces. So um, I learned about that only in the last year or so, and I thought that's incredible because not only did, did he have a sort of passing knowledge of this music, he actually knew every note that Kupran wrote. And as you can hear in that piece, uh, it's a very distinctive style. Um, you can never mistake it for another composer. Incidentally, uh, Kupram was born 350 years ago this year. And so um, it's amazing to discover in his works so many surprises. And one of the reasons why I wanted to play that and just bring up the, the topic is because I think the Handel variations um, that I'm going to play have something in common with Kupram's harpsichord pieces which is, they're not only dances, there are dances. There's recognizable, the Allemands and the Gigues and Sarabans, et cetera, et cetera. But the vast majority of Kupran's um, harpsichord pieces are portraits or caricatures. Mm. They are inspired by real people. And each of them stands on their own as well as functioning in a larger cycle or in the order. He calls them orders, I think, for a reason. Um, th there is a, unity is a major consideration. In their, in their composition. And so I hear some of the variations that Brahms wrote in this piece almost like that. They almost stand alone, like a little character piece. They're not, in other words, they're not all dependent on what comes before and what comes after. Some of them are. You'll hear that there are groups that flow right from one to the next, and others that, that are more um, kind of independent. Um, Brahms was very proud of this piece, and he said that one of the things that he really looked for when considering a theme um, for a set of variations is not only the melodic uh, possibilities, but also the nature of the bass, the bass line. The bass line was really what he felt was the fertile ground from which he could build um, a structure like this, which is 25 variations in a piece. It's kind of a phenomenal achievement. I think even more phenomenal than that is that there's not a trace of the academic in it. It all flows very organically, and somehow he's able to combine all these different styles, which are not of various composers and, and times and places, in a way that um, it's somehow completely unified by the end of the piece. You, you sort of have the sense of the whole thing laid out before you, and uh, it's kind of a compendium of, of Brahms' influence, uh, especially from the Baroque. So I thought I would just introduce the theme a little bit and some of its properties. And the nice thing is that uh, because of the, the structure of this piece being in these rather short variations, um, the, some things will be immediately apparent more so than in the Chopin Sonata, for example. And I thought uh, for future reference for myself, if the Brahms handle variations are the lighter portion of the program, I need to do something different. Um, so. Here's the bass line. Similar kind of pattern. 
can hear immediately not only the drums tracing these steps, but it's also using the bass line, which is this principal note, lower neighbor, and back. So you get this. substantial and independent of the variation. This is a kind of Hungarian, almost funeral march, which is one of the reasons why I thought I would pair this piece with the first half. Um, it's in this low register, much like the, the Chopin. And also, Kupram is very fond of this baritone register. He likes the sort of, uh, the, the warmth and color of this, of this register that's uh, darker than if it had been set up here. So that this Hungarian variation sounds like this.
then suddenly you have something that is almost sounds like it should be a web. Yeah, no. <coughs> um, and so on and so on. Um, one of my favorite juxtapositions to one of variations in general, and then it's the one that um, follows it. It's number 19, which is Montevideo y Vivace. And this is one of the most overtly Baroque, I think. This, this could actually be, have, this could have been written by a Baroque composer. <laughs> does all the usual 
little trick that Fox does, which is to uh, accelerate and, and augment. So you'll get the theme in kind of a slow motion half time.
for Nick and to the Ross McKee Foundation for inviting me. Um, I'll say goodnight with uh, a short piece by Francois Couperin. This is um, a piece called Les Jumelets, uh, <coughs> Twins. <laughs> 